hope you all had a good and Merry Christmas. Take your hymnals, if you will, and we'll turn to number 422. Not quite ready to leave Christmas behind yet, so 422, stand with me if you're able. How does leave thy throne? 422. Thou didst leave thy throne and thy kingly crown when thou camest to earth for me. But in Bethlehem's home there was found no room for thy holy nativity. Oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus, there is room. Arches rang when the angels sang, proclaiming thy royal decree. But in lowly birth is thou come to earth, and in greatest humility. Oh, come to thy heart, Lord Jesus, there is room in my heart. Verse number four. Thou camest, O Lord, with the living word that should set my people free. But with mocking scorn and with crown of thorn, they bore thee to Calvary. Oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus, there is room. coming to victory. Let thy voice call me home, saying, yet there is room, there is room at my side for thee. My heart shall rejoice, Lord Jesus, when thou comest and callest for me. Amen. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the perfect timing and the perfect foreknowledge that you had concerning thy coming when the fullness of time was come, when it was a perfect time. Lord, I pray that you be glorified now as we kneel before thee, that uh, we would accept of thy hand what your word has for us this morning. And we might not go the same as we came but that we might be changed, that we might be comforted, that we might be convicted. Lord, that we might be converted. I pray that you be glorified now in this time that we spend together. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. 429, 429. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. 429. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king, peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled, joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. Second birth, oh. 
amen. As far as announcements go, we are at the end of the year. It's amazing, isn't it? 2021, 2022, right around the corner. After the service this morning, we have a baptismal, one that is uh, following the Lord and believer's baptism, and so I hope that'll be a blessing to you. If you have not been, if you're saved and know it, but you have not been baptized, we'd love to um, join you in following the Lord in believer's baptism. As far as coming up this um, Friday is New Year's Eve. We do not have anything planned, but last Wednesday when we were together, it was kind of jostled around that maybe we could have a game night. And so um, don't have anything planned. I'm kind of throwing this out to, to see what kind of uh, feedback we get. What do you think about having like a five o'clock soup and sandwich and then have uh, games for um, a couple hours and then have some testimonies and devotional at uh, around 7. Who would be up for that? Okay, let's plan on that. Um, 5 o'clock Friday, and then we'll maybe be done around 7.30. Nothing, uh, no, not going into midnight or anything like that. <laughs> but uh, let's plan on that um, 5 o'clock on Friday, December 31st. And then remember, January 2nd, next Sunday, is our um, fellowship luncheon that we have at the first Sunday fellowship. So do remember that. That's what's coming up here in the next week. Yes? I just want to go about the Friday night. Okay, that'll be a blessing. If somebody wants to help out with that, do you mind if I share your phone number? All right. Yep. So if somebody wants to help out with that, you're welcome to text me and I can make sure you get connected with, with Peggy. So praise the Lord for that. Ray was able to come home, and uh, Mark was as well. So continue to pray for them. They're not um, not uh, feeling 100%, but um, praise the Lord for the, the, the health that they are feeling, able to be home with family and, and uh, relax in that manner. Uh, this time, I'd uh, Phil uh, Malone would like to make a presentation. So uh, Phil, you come up and... appreciate it thank you it's amazing to see the lord uh, lord provide in the ways that he does i believe those are the announcements for what's coming up and uh, so we'll take our hymnals again 421 421 the first noel the first noel the angel did say was to certain poor shepherds in fields where they lay, in fields where they lay, keeping their feet on a cold winter's night that was so deep. Noel, 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 born is the King of Israel. Verse number three is stop. 
24 O come all ye faithful 424 O come all ye faithful joyful and triumphant O come ye O come ye to Bethlehem come and behold singing this morning. At this time, we'll dismiss the Children's Church. And so, Miss Miss Nostein? Three times a day. Right. Okay. Yes. Thank you for that update. I do remember to continue to pray for Mark. Um, not out of the woods, still, still three treatments a day, um, like Dixie says. So appreciate um, that update. Do remember him in prayer, and do reach out if there's any time that we can, we can help. Uh, we want to be, that's what family's for, and so we want to be um, a part of that. Good. Anything else? All right. Take your Bibles this morning, if you will, and turn to... Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2, probably very familiar, especially at this time of year. Luke chapter 2, and it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city, and Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished 
that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we covet your presence among us, Lord. If you're not here in our midst, we've met together in vain. So we thank you for thy word that we can read, and we pray that you would touch our hearts, each one. May it humble us, and may it help us to stand in awe of who you are. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, it's sad to see America continuing in the downward trend of commercializing Christmas and forgetting about the reason of Christmas, the Christ in Christmas. First of all, it was Merry Xmas, and and then now it's got to be Happy Holidays and a hundred other things. What are people going to do when they realize that holidays is actually a derivative of the Mosaic Law, the Holy Days? I don't know. That's going to have to be changed, too. But uh, anyway, I'd venture to say that the majority of children who were opening presents yesterday had no idea, even in America, that Christmas is about Christ. No idea what the celebration of the birth of Jesus is. How many had the Christmas story read to them on Christmas morning or told to them? How many had somebody telling them about the first Christmas gift that ever came down, the unspeakable gift that is given to mankind? Instead, they probably had somebody dress up like Santa. And, uh, you know... This Christmas, I even saw a preacher dressed up as Santa. How about that? I'm not here to knock Santa. I just don't like the fact that a, the, the, uh, the concentration is so viciously pulled away from Christ. Here we have a beautiful story of, of Jesus' birth recorded for us. Luke, the, uh, the beloved physician and companion of the Apostle Paul, he writes from the viewpoint of mankind, he, he writes about Jesus being fully man. You, you see the name Son of Man many times in the book of Luke. John writes as if he's the Son of God. He was both. He was fully man. He was fully God. But we have these different viewpoints. And so we have within the story of that Luke gives us is that Jesus is fully man. We see his humanity. We see all that is happening on the world stage And so it begins with the introduction of Caesar Augustus. Luke chapter 2 and verse number 1, Caesar Augustus is mentioned. This is the first and only time that his name is mentioned in history. He's a very important person on the world stage. He was the the, prominent Roman uh, emperor and Caesar and mentioned with great prominence and importance in, his, in the pages of history books. But he's only mentioned this one time in the Bible. And then we get he down to verse number 7, and we read of the birth of the Christ child, Mary's firstborn son. I'd like to consider the significance of these two. Of one, it could be argued that he was the greatest Roman emperor, the greatest Roman Caesar ever to be uh, come to the throne. And yet, you and I would probably struggle to remember anything about him. His name, his real name, his birth name. He was Caesar Augustus. He's recorded uh, on pages of history, but we really forget about him. On the other hand... We have one who was born a baby to a poor young virgin in a poor home. Not even able to buy him clothes or provide a room for him to be born in. And yet his name is known in every language known to man. This Caesar is referred to in history as the first of the Roman emperors. He was a great nephew of Julius Caesar, brought up... um, for much of his life, by Julius Caesar's sister, Julia Caesarus. 
Um, not sure if I pronounced that correct, but basically the same name as Julius Caesar. And when Caesar died, he, was, he, he declared in his will that Octavius, which was his name, and later be called, to be called Octavian, um, be his successor. And of course the census, or the, the, the Senate, pardon me, uh, agreed to that. And he came to the throne, so to speak, as a teenager of 17 years old. 17 years old when he came to the, to the uh, throne of Rome. And Rome was a mess. Rome was in complete turmoil. And he had a brilliant mind. He shrewdly connected and combined the military power and the institutional uh, uh, building of the nation, the lawmakers. He combined them all together, and he became Rome's sole ruler, laying the foundation for peace within the empire, the Pax Romana, which... Um, which continued on for over 200 more years um, after he had had it established. His boundaries of his empire reached to England, down into North Africa, from the Atlantic Ocean all the way to the Euphra Euphrates River, massive um, land mass there. The, the whole known world was under his leadership. But when we... You know, he was so important that the Senate um, was the one that gave him the name of Augustus. Most of the Caesars pronounced themselves to be great, but his Senate pronounced him to be Augustus, Caesar Augustus. But when we compare Augustus Caesar, the greatest of the Roman emperors, to a child that was born of a virgin within his empire, unknown, uncared for. When we compare the two, Caesar Augustus becomes a footnote in history, a footnote on the, the pages of history. And so as we look at Caesar and the Christ child, I'd like to see, first of all, God's perfect foreknowledge, God's perfect foreknowledge in bringing all of this to pass. With the knowledge of the prophecy of Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, you cannot read more than uh, four verses into this passage when you get down to verse number four before you realize that God already had a sovereign plan. God already had something in mind. He already knew when Micah wrote about it. Micah was a contemporary of Isaiah. And so 700 years before it happened, God already knew about Caesar Augustus. He already knew that a teen would come to the throne in Rome. He already knew that there would be a taxing that Caesar would, would put upon all of his realm, including Israel. And that would take Joseph and Mary from Nazareth down to Bethlehem. He already knew. God had perfect foreknowledge. And so it is for you and me. Before I was born, God knew me. God knew, uh, God knows what's going to happen tomorrow. God knows the mistakes and the failures that I'm going to trip and fall this next week and this next year. He knows the times that I will refuse to listen to the Spirit's whisper. He knows everything about me, and the beautiful thing about it is He still loves me. He still loves you and me. He knows everything about me, about you, about this town, about this country, about the world. Almost 8 billion people in the world, and God knew all about them, according to Scripture, before the creation of the world. Perfect knowledge. The book of Acts and Romans and 1 Peter all speak about the foreknowledge of God. But so does the book of Isaiah in chapter 46 and verses 9 and 10. It says, remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. Uh, side note there, if, uh, if you ever have a, uh, a Mormon come to your door, that's a good verse. Because uh, they don't believe that God is the only God. Um, they certainly don't believe that Jesus is the only Son of God. And so uh, that's a good verse right there. I am God and there is none else. 
I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. Wow. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. God says, I can tell you something and how it will end before it's even started. I can tell you ancient history that hasn't even happened yet. And he did. He told, foretold that Jesus would come and where he would come and how he'd be born. God is not trapped in time like you and I are. He, he, he lives in eternity, um, in, in eternity, no past, no present, no future. He's not bound by that. And we need to remember that actually when we're studying prophecy because God tells things as he sees them. And so when we studying prophecy, it's not always chronolo chronological. Um, and so that's one of the things we need to remember. You read the book of Revelation and you'll see that God has written down 2,000 years ago well, the, some of the things that are going to come to pass um, right after the rapture and right up to the rapture. Um, but, um, and it will, it'll happen just as God said it would happen. 700 years before Christ was born, the Lord wrote through the pen of Isaiah that Jesus would be born a virgin. 700 years before Jesus was born, Micah wrote, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is to be, born, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. None other but Jesus Christ. Only God could have foretold this. Think of the turmoil and the trouble that Israel went through after that prophecy was foretold. They went into captivity in Babylon. They were taken over and controlled by the Medes and the Persians for uh, years. And then came the, the uh, Greece with Alexander the Greek, uh, then we, the Great. Then we have Rome that is now in control. Think of the turmoil that went on after that prophecy happened. The, the, the subduing of the people, the uprooting, the killing that, that happened. The, the people that were in the, in the lineage of David were in captivity. And yet the prophecy was made that Jesus, who would come from them, would be born in Bethlehem. And it happened exactly as the prophet recorded. God didn't go about to find a suitable person in Bethlehem a suitable virgin in Bethlehem so that that prophecy could happen. <laughs> he found somebody in Nazareth. And he said, I'll get her there in time. Not a problem. He had a perfect foreknowledge of what, it, what would go on. Mary and Joseph would have to go to Bethlehem at this prescribed time. And they would be in time for the birth. I hope that is an encouragement to you. That we can trust in the foreknowledge of God. That, 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 we can, that we can trust in him that what he says will happen, will. And, and when he gives us a promise, we can put our faith in that promise no matter what it looks like. Amen. Think of Abraham and the faith that he had. And the things that he let go to Lot and, and, uh, and others that he just didn't worry about. And it all came out all right, just as God had promised. God knew that the emperor would declare the taxing. He knew that it would be enforced so that both jo Joseph and Mary had to go. Do you think Joseph and Mary would have gone if they hadn't had to go? No, they wouldn't have gone. But the taxing forced everybody to go. Nothing about the situation around the birth of Christ took God by surprise. He had already foreknew it. He had already declared it. Why is it that we have so much trouble trusting in Him? Why is it that we have so much trouble with obedience, with believing? James, the brother of Jesus, the half-brother of Jesus, and uh, pastor at the Church of Jerusalem said in Acts chapter 15, Known unto God are all His works from the beginning of the world. God has a perfect foreknowledge of what is going to happen. He his counsels will not be disturbed. Romans chapter 8, 
It says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. God already knew what would happen, what would go on. How can he make all things work together for good on our behalf? Because he already knows what will be. It wasn't a mistake that Joseph and Mary were caught up in the taxing. That was a hardship for them. It didn't look good from the world's um, perspective. They mis they, they, I'm sure they misunderstood what was going on. They were already poor. Caesar was sitting on his throne in Rome, sending out edicts, edicts to expand his, his borders and to secure his realm. But in reality, he was fulfilling the will of God. That's what he was doing. He was fulfilling the counsel of God. Acts chapter 2 and verse 23 says, Him, Peter is speaking, and he's speaking about Jesus, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Again in Acts chapter 4 and verse 26, Peter is speaking again, The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. Oh, they thought they were acting in their own independence. They thought that, they, that killing Jesus was, was all their doing. But it was God's plan of redemption for you and me. God's perfect plan. God's plan does not move aside for wicked man. Never has and it never will. God's plan does not move aside. Wicked man uh, fulfills the plan of God. Revelation chapter 17, we've been studying in Sunday school. Um, we see that the ten kings who the beast sets up over this one world empire in the last day, anyone who is uh, called upon the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation will not be there in that day. We will be raptured with Jesus. We'll be off the earth. Amen. But this wickedness is going on, and the ten kings, uh, the puppet kings of the beast, are, are doing what they consider to be their will. And in verse 17 of chapter 17, it says, For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And so they all con uh, are confederate, one with another, and they come upon Babylon and destroy Babylon, thinking that they will rid uh, Babylon off the, the, this uh, thorn in their side, off the face of the earth. But really, they are performing the judgment that God already proclaimed by the mouth of Jeremiah that would happen to uh, Babylon. God already had planned it. They think they're fulfilling their own desires. And God just gave them an opportunity. This is what you can do if you want to. Oh, I'd love to do that. And so they go in headlong rush to do what God has already... We see that in the life of Pharaoh as well. Pharaoh and uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar, you're only in power because the God of heaven said... You can, you can conquer these lands. And I don't know how Nebuchadnezzar took that, but um, at least he didn't lash out at Daniel, did he? But, um, but yeah, when we consider this concept, it should both humble us and cause us to rejoice because God's got everything under control. Nothing is outside of his control. But God knows me. He knows who I am. He loves me. He forgives me. And I can face tomorrow because I'm in his hand. John chapter 10 says, no man can pluck you out of his hand. No man. You're in God's hand. There isn't anybody that's going to open that hand. And uh, that is the case if you have been saved and uh, put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Remember the verse in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. 
Remember the verses before that? It says, therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. In other words, God already knows what you're going to need tomorrow, even more than you know what you're going to need tomorrow. You don't know what, what uh, thing is going to come into your life to just throw a monkey wrench into everything. So commit your ways to the Lord today. He already knows what lies ahead. David said in Psalm 35 or 37, verse 5, Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Solomon said in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 3, Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. How many people are going around today all messed up in their mind? A lot of people. Commit your works unto the Lord, and your thoughts will be established. You'll have peace. Stop fretting and fearing because the, the horizon looks gloomy. Because of uh, you don't approve of, of who was elected or who wasn't elected or, or whatever the case may be. God has it under control and nobody is in power who he has not ordained that should be in power. We may not see it as reasonable, but it didn't look good for Abraham either. When Lot chose all the good land, and the, the, uh, the, the plains of Jordan that were so fresh and green. But five years later, it wasn't Abraham that lost everything. When the kings came in and, and, and took and plundered Sodom and Gomorrah. And then 15 years later, it wasn't Abraham who lost everything, including his wife and many of his children that Lot lost. When the fire and brimstone fell upon Sodom, lost everything. You and I need to learn to trust God, especially, folks, when things look bleak. Especially. This is the way it was for Joseph and Mary. It looked so discouraging as they were making their way on that long journey from, from Nazareth all the way down to Bethlehem. For what? Just to give this ruler, Roman ruler in, uh, in Rome more money or, or more of my, uh, I guess, Probably they were filling out a census, more of my privacy or whatever. Whatever it was, it looked gloomy. It looked uh, bleak, especially when they got there and there was no place to say. God may allow something in my life today that I consider inconvenient, that I consider a real hardship. But I've got to have the trust and the faith and the obedience to realize that he knows what's going to happen in 20 years. Maybe this will be for my good. Maybe this will be in fulfillment of something. I heard a story years ago. I don't know if it's true or not. I'd love to believe it's true. But years ago, there was a chief in the Congo region um, of Africa. And he had a friend who had gotten saved. The chief was not saved, but he had gotten a, had a friend who was saved. And he had this habit of saying, God is good all the time. Especially when things looked bleak. Especially when things looked uh, bad. And for the most part, the chief ignored him. He was a good friend. And till one day they were out hunting. And the friend was loading the firearms. And the chief was shooting the firearms because that's the way it works when you're a chief. And so um, something jammed. I'm not sure whether it was a cartridge that was loaded incorrectly or whether it was a faulty cartridge. But something jammed and it blew the chamber out and mangled the chief's thumb. And eventually he lost his thumb. And he overheard his friend saying, God is good all the time. Well, that infuriated the, the, the chief, and he, he just came over and, and let him have it. How bad does it have to be before you realize that things are just so horrible, God's not in control? And he ordered his friend to be hauled off and locked up. And as he was being hauled off in, by the, the, the guards and the soldiers that were along, 
he could hear him saying, God is good all the time. Well, the ensuing year brought much grief to the chief, and though he thought very little about his friend, he did um, enter into much uh, fighting and tribal wars, and he was captured by a tribe that was known to be a cannibalistic tribe, and the whole surrounding area was called to a dinner in his honor. He was the dinner. And as he was uh, being tied to the spit, uh, all of a sudden the, 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 chi uh, the uh, braves that were around him rushed off. I guess they're probably not called braves in Africa, but the men that were around him uh, rushed off into a tent and there was much commotion in a tent and, and overcame uh, three of the, the men and roughly untied him and uh, dragged him to the edge of the village and, and, uh, and he's very confused. He said, what is, what is going on here? Uh, why are you untying me? And they said, we notice that you do not have two thumbs. You will bring evil upon your vil our village you are a disgrace. Go off and die in the wilderness. Of course, at that very moment, his mind immediately flashed to the day on the plane where he lost his thumb and his friend said, God is good all the time. And he rushed back to his own village and into the, uh, the uh, makeshift jail where he had... Uh, left his friend and he ran in there and he found his friend and he said, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And his friend said, God is good all the time. And he said, how can you say this? I have left you in here for a year, a, a, over a year, and, and you've been, been punished for something that, that was my fault, that, 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 that turned out to be good. And he said, Chief, God is good all the time. If I hadn't been in jail, I would have been with you, and I still have both my thumbs. <laughs> God is good all the Why is it so hard for you and I to just trust God, even when we're going through something that seems like an inconvenience to us? Read the life of Joseph, 13 years. Read the life of Daniel, the hardships that he went through, Ruth, Esther. Why is this so hard for us? Just to trust that God has my good in mind. Oh, how quick we are to blame God, to curse God, when you and I don't have things worked out the way we hoped. But God has perfect foreknowledge. Secondly, God has perfect timing. Not only does God have perfect foreknowledge, he also has perfect timing. It was no mistake that Julius Caesar would be assassinated by the Senate at 44 BC and a teenager would come who was a military masterminder, come to the throne and unite the whole known world, secure an empire stretching from as far as anybody had ever traveled. It was no mistake that peace was secured throughout the whole known world it was no mistake that a common language was established at the birth of Jesus Christ. It was no mistake that a system of roads were built by this Roman uh, emperor that sped travel from country to country and a postal system was established. Everything here was used to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ in the coming years. It was no mistake. And when God sat, uh, looked down, he didn't see a wicked priesthood who would one day um, carelessly kill the creator and redeemer. He didn't see a Caesar uh, that was uh, making a mess of everything in Israel like the Jews saw it. He saw the very thing that would push the spread of the good news across the known world. And so he said in, in Galatians chapter 4, when the fullness of time was come. When the cup of what God had planned was to the brim and just bubbling over a little bit. It couldn't be any better. When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them 
that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. God's timing was perfect. God's timing was perfect. With Caesar securing Israel as one of his territories, the Holy Land became a crossroads. We call Indiana the crossroads of America. The Holy Land became a crossroads from Europe down to North Africa to Asia. There was nobody that came, went from continent to continent without passing through the Holy Land. And we see in Acts chapter 2 and verse 9, on the day of Pentecost, how many people were passing through Israel. If you want to turn there, Acts chapter 2 and verse 9, it says there's Parthians and Medes and Elamites and dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia, in Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, in Egypt, in the parts of Libya about Cyrene, the strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. All of these people were passing through uh, the Holy Land because of a Caesar up in Rome who had secured peace throughout all of this territory. All because Jesus Christ was born and the good news needed to be spread throughout the whole world. There's a, a book called History of the Baptist by Dr. Orchid. Um, and he writes that uh, some, of the, some of Paul's converts were as far away from Wales itself. He writes that about 50 BC, the Romans invaded the British Isle and were defeated by the Welsh king, uh, Cassabellan. I'm not sure how to pronounce that, but I'm going to say Cass Cassabellan. Having failed, they made peace and dwelt among them. And during this time, the Welsh joined the Roman army and many visited Rome. Among those who visited Rome in 63 AD, when Paul was in prison, were Welsh royalty, Linus and his sister Claudia, who married a Roman senator, Rufus, Pruden, uh, Rufus Pudens. They were converted by Paul, who was at that time a, a prisoner in Rome, and um, they took the gospel back to Wales with them. Now, we read about them in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, in verse 21, where the Apostle Paul says to greet um, Linus and Claudia and Pudens. And so we see evidence that the good news of the gospel is spread throughout the world. Just use that as a one example. When the fullness of time was come, when everything was perfect, when the timing was perfect, for, for, for things to come together, when the world was perfectly prepared, when there was trade uh, routes, and, and, and when there was uh, travel routes across the, the, the known world by land and by sea, when the world was culturally and, and spiritually topsy-turvy and people were ready to listen to the truth of the gospel, were searching for answers, God said, now is the perfect time. Now is the fullness of time. And so it is in your life and mine. God already knows. God already knows. He already has a, a, a perfect plan, a perfect timing. If you and I will just listen to him. We'll say oops. God never says oops. God, God doesn't make mistakes. His timing is perfect. And then very quickly... Uh, God's perfect future. When we look at what's going on in the world today, we often say, well, long for the good old days. Long for, we say it's, it's worse now than it ever has been before. No, really it hasn't. It's not as bad today as it was in Jesus' day. Fact is, we have more comforts and conveniences than we've ever experienced. Most of us have never known, most of us here have never known a war like our fathers or grandfathers have. It's not as bad, worse than it ever has been, but it is set to get much worse in the tribulation time. Scripture does not uh, foretell of any empire after the Roman Empire that will rule the world until the tribulation age. Plenty have tried it. Napoleon declared 
himself to uh, be that, didn't succeed. Hitler tried it. God didn't allow it. Fact is, the only nation that even came remotely close was England. And uh, they used it for the spread of the gospel around the world. And so God allowed it. But um, it seems that the prophecy of Daniel, from the prophecy of Daniel, that some sort of revived Roman Empire will form again into a one final world kingdom that will rise up once more in the last days only to be defeated by Jesus. Amen. Only to be defeated by Jesus. And of course, it will not be Caesar Augustus who will be the emperor. But I will tell you this, it will be that same Jesus. The same Jesus that was born in Bethlehem. The angels said to the disciples in Acts chapter 1 and verse 11, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus. Isn't that a good phrase? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. And Revelation chapter 19 clearly gives us the details of when he's coming back. He's coming back with eyes of, uh, fl eyes of flames of fire. He's coming back with a sword proceeding out of his mouth. It's no uh, coincidence that the word of God is called a two-edged sword. And in that day, the sword, the words coming out of his mouth will be as a sword. It is no um, coincidence. And the saints of heaven will follow on white horses as well, clothed in fine linen and clean. Out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and with it he should smite the nations, and he should rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. It'll be a good day to be behind the Lord Jesus Christ coming back to earth and not looking, uh, being down on earth, looking up at him coming. It'll be a glorious day. If you're not saved today, today is the day. You don't know how much longer you'll have. If your faith is anchored in God, your, per your future is perfect. Amen. You've got a perfect future. My faith is in God. Knows all things. Knew the perfect time for Christ to be born. I want my future in his hands. I'm glad, his, I'm, glad I'm his child. I'm glad I'm his child. I'm glad to be a Christian. I'm glad to have forgiveness of sins. I'm glad that he saved me. And I have the promise of being with him someday because of his great salvation. If you've never trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior, can I plead with you today? Don't put it off another day. Don't put it off another day. Read the prophecies of Jesus Christ himself in Matthew 24 and 25. They are coming to pass in front of our eyes. The, the pestilence, the worldwide plagues and diseases and, and the, the, the wars and rumors of wars and everything that Jesus said is coming to pass. If you're saved today and you know it, Jesus says this, watch and be ready. Don't be taken by surprise. He tells us what to do. Get in the word of God and find it out. If you don't know that you're saved, if you have not followed him, uh, uh, his, uh, his command, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Confess his name with your mouth. Then today there's no better time than right now. Will you allow us to show you from the word of God? how to know for sure that you're saved today. I'm going to ask uh, Brother Mike if you'll come and Brother Merlin if you'll come. Brother Merlin is going to lead us in uh, the uh, invitation and in the closing. And um, we are going to get ready for the baptism. Let's just close in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, that you have touched each one of our hearts today. I pray that you would be with us now and be with Brother Nathan as he follows you in obedience to your command in believer's baptism. Baptism does not save us. 
but it does show an outwardly what has inwardly happened in our hearts at salvation. And so, Lord, I pray that you be glorified now in this step of obedience. Be with us now as we uh, consider the, the things that were spoken, consider how you've spoken to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. your psalm books and turn to hymn number 174 that Christ that Christ child was born to die upon Calvary for each one of us and if as pastor said if you've never been saved we'd love to to lead you in that prayer of salvation and show you the way to eternal life because Jesus is coming again and we need to be sure of that salvation this is a this is a house of prayer you come forward as God leads hymn number 174 Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, I say. stop with that I would just like to say too if any of Nathan's family would like to move to the front so they can see better you're welcome to do that and if I could get Max and Nathan to come help me we'll move this furniture and get ready to have a baptism exciting time of life well, that's what uh, baptism symbolizes baptism does not save you but it does symbolize the change that Jesus Christ made in the heart of the believer and so Nathan is it your testimony that you've been saved and called upon the name of the Lord yes it is 
Would you give us a, a brief testimony this morning? Yes. Um, I would like to start out by saying uh, I was raised in church my whole life, um, but going to church makes you saved about as much as putting a, a glove on a dirty hand uh, makes that hand clean. Um, on September 2nd of this year, 2021, I gave my life fully to God, and he changed my life completely. Like I have, like I have done, anyone can choose to hide their sin, but I was not hiding anything from God. Uh, he knows my heart, and I would like to add that he knows yours too. You can put that glove on, and you can hide your, your dirty hand like I did, you, and, but it, it will still be dirty. My life was still full of sin until I let God come in and clean my heart and uh, with his gift of his son by his dying on the cross. Um, when Only then did he take my sins away. That is what happened in my life, and now I know that I am on my way to heaven. Um, I like to conclude by saying uh, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Amen. Nathan, upon your confession of faith and your obedience to the Lord's command, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Buried in his likeness. Raised again to walk in newness of life. The Lord has blessed us richly with some baptisms, the salvations and baptisms this year. If uh, you have never been baptized, well, first of all, if you've never been saved, we'd love to lead you in the Word of God, not in our opinion or doctrine, but in the Word of God, how you can know for sure that you're saved and on your way to heaven. And then, if you've never been baptized, we'd love to have the privilege of walk, taking that step with you. And uh, so, if that's you... We'd love to hear from you. Brother Merlin? Down in the valley with my Savior I would go Where the flowers are blooming and the sweet waters flow With His hand to lead me I will never, never fear Walking in the ground be near Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus Anywhere, everywhere, I would follow on Follow, follow Jesus, I would follow on. Down in the valley with my Savior I would go, where the storms are sweeping and the dark waters flow. With his hand to lead me, I will never, never fear. Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus. Anywhere, everywhere, I would follow on, follow, follow, I would follow Jesus. Anywhere he leads me, I would follow on. Down in the valley or up on the mountain steep, close beside my Savior would my soul ever keep. He will lead me safely in the path that he has trod. Up to where they gather on the hills of God. Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus. Anywhere, everywhere, I would follow on. Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus. Anywhere he leads me, I would follow on. Amen. Brother Paul Merrifield, could you close us in prayer, please? <laughs> 